All right. Uh, good morning. I'm Charles Miller. The name of the little short presentation today is a recipe for an art flash disaster. And this is on the 2021 NFPA 70E that just came out a couple of weeks ago. All right. What's then how difficult is it uh, when cooking up an art flash disaster? I think it's uh, one uninsulated screwdrivers, uh, one insulated screwdriver out of five in this uninsulated screwdriver. It means it's it's very easy to cause an arc flash. Um, what are the ingredients? Unqualified person or persons, uh, but qualified persons can also be included or substituted. The recipe can be baked, broiled, or fried. Other ingredients might include uh, working on energized equipment, not putting electrical equipment into an electrically safe work condition, not wearing shock and art flash uh, PPE. Um, I don't I don't have to explain anymore what PPE is uh, because of the pandemic this year. I think every person in America, probably every person in the world, knows what PPE is. Uh, also, other ingredients would include not complying with OSHA electrical safety provisions, not complying with NFPA 70E requirements. All right, so all kidding aside, electrical safety is no joking matter. What we're gonna look at today, what we're gonna talk about is I'm gonna summarize the purpose of 70E, the standard for electrical safety in the workplace. Again, this one, the, the presentation has been updated and includes the 2021 edition. I've got some, some changes in here that are in the 20. 21, and I'll show them throughout the presentation. Also identify who should be trained in electrical safety. Uh, recall the eight steps in establishing and verifying an electrical, electrically safe work condition. Of course, we don't have time to go over all of them. I'll, I'll show what the steps are and, and go over uh, one of the steps uh, in, in a, a bit of detail. Also, to clarify the shock protection boundaries as well as the arc flash boundary, explain information found on the equipment labels, uh, identify the two methods that are permitted in 70E for selecting uh, arc flash PPE. Also, determine the, uh, arc, the arc flash PPE category in, a, in accordance with uh, 130.7C15 tables. What we actually need, of course, are recipes for preventing art flash disasters. I am an electrician by trade. I, came, I went through the electrical apprenticeship program. Back then, uh, you, we were taught very little, if any, uh, electrical safety uh, rules and regulations. Uh, in, in fact, I'm the poster child of things not to do when it comes to electrical safety because of either uh, the way I was taught or the way I was not taught the proper way of doing things. The NAPA contains provisions to guide us in the right directions and in direction and to prevent uh, electrical incidents. The purpose of 70 is to provide a practical, safe working area for employees relative to the hazards that arise from using electricity. When information on a slide uh, comes out of 70E, and you probably see this in the lower left slide, is the, the section number where the, the purpose of uh, uh, 70E is located. All right, so then where do we start? Electrical safety and electrical incident prevention starts with what? Well, it starts with training. Uh, training is needed to learn a trade, a craft, or even a task. An example, a person might attend an electrical apprenticeship school to learn the electrical trade. And hopefully we are getting more and more students to attend trade schools. I know for a long time that was something that in high school was just not pushed. Uh, I, when I Years and years ago when I went to my uh, daughter's graduation and then my son's graduation. Uh, the they were at, at the graduations pushing, pushing, pushing t for every uh, child to go into college. And so, of course, and at the time I was thinking, well, in 20 years, 
20, 25 years, there's going to be a shortage of tradespeople, and here we are with that. So electrical safety training should be included in that initial training. Again, I was not, we didn't have electrical safety training. Uh, I was taught um, the, the left-hand rule. That's one of the things I was taught. Uh, that means if you're standing in front of a disconnect, you, instead of turning it on or off directly in front of it, you step to the side and you turn the disconnect on or off or the safety switch on or off with your left hand. Now, is that a, a good rule? Yes, it, it's not in 70E, but it's a good thing to do to not stand directly in front of uh, electrical equipment, electrical disconnects when you're turning them, uh, turning them on and off. Qualified persons have to be trained and knowledgeable in the construction and operation of equipment or of a specific work method. This is in 110.6A1, but it is also part of the definition of a qualified person. Qualified persons also have to be trained to identify and avoid electrical hazards that might be present with respect to that equipment or work method. Additional training for qualified uh, for a qualified person uh, is in that same section and 70 says such persons shall also be familiar with the, the proper use of special precautionary techniques, applicable electrical policies and procedures, PPE, insulated, insulating and shielding materials, as well as insulated tools and test equipment. Well, mention the definition of a qualified person. What is uh, what is a qualified person? 70E, which is a little bit different from the National Electrical Code, which, and it's a little bit different from uh, OSHA, it says one who de has demonstrated skills and knowledge related to the construction and operation of electrical equipment and installations and has received safety training to identify the hazards and reduce the associated risk. Uh, this is a, a picture from... Uh, that, that uh, I'm in the red hard hat. It's from uh, some training I did in, in Paul Tuckett, Rhode Island, uh, about a year and almost two years ago. We had already had the classroom training the day before, and this was training uh, with uh, for hands-on training. Unqualified persons. This is uh, in 70, it says unqualified persons have to be trained in and familiar with any electrical safety related practices necessary for their safety. Well, if you're familiar with 70E, you're, you're also familiar and you also know that unless you're a qualified person, you're not supposed to be touching uh, live energized electrical. And so I've got a picture up here uh, and it looks like this person is doing something, testing, and, and it looks like he's in front of live energized electrical equipment, but yet the definition up here is for unqualified person. Well, the folk, the, this person in the picture is a qualified person. The focus of this picture is not the person, it's not the equipment, it's the boundaries that has been laid out around the person. It's the, uh, and if that's the arc flash boundary, that's, we'll talk about the definition of an arc flash boundary in a little while, but that unqualified people need to understand that if you see somebody doing potentially live electrical, it looks like they're doing live electrical, if there's a boundary, do not cross that boundary. Don't even go up to it. Uh, because if there is an arc flash incident, if there and if that boundary has been laid out to the exact uh, arc flash boundary, then just standing at that boundary when there's an arc flash event, the person standing at that boundary, not wearing uh, arc rated PPE, which they wouldn't have to outside the boundary, but they could receive a a first degree burn on their exposed skin uh, just by being at the boundary. Now, if they cross over the boundary, they could receive a second or third degree uh, burn by crossing the, that arc flash boundary. Types of training in accordance with 70E, training can be in the classroom, it can be on the job, it can be any combination of the two. 
the lower left picture, the left picture is some training I did back in January of this year when we were traveling and still traveling at that point until uh, all traveling came to a stop in March. And this, this was training I did for a group in the country of Suriname. Now raise your hand if you know where Suriname is. I would say I would be surprised if uh, more than one or two people uh, watching this webinar knows where Suriname is. Uh, I had just heard of the country a few months before that Suriname is South America. It is above Brazil in between uh, Guiana and French Guiana. Go, going on with 70, it says employees have to be trained to select an appropriate test instrument and have to demonstrate how to use the device to verify the absence of voltage, including interpreting indications that are provided by the device. Uh, this is a meter that I have that is a, a it is a great meter. This is a, a Fluke uh, T6-1000. This meter reads voltage and current at the same time without having to use the probes. Uh, you can see in the picture here that it's reading, it's just taking the current measurement. Uh, it's, it's amazing that the forks don't have to close because normally in amp probes, uh, we, we have to put it around a wire and it, where the clamp closes around a wire. This is an open fork, which is amazing. The other thing is this meter reads voltage and current at the same time. Uh, Fluke has a model below this, the T5-1000, and it will read voltage or current one or the other, but not both at the same time like this one. Additional training and retraining. Here's a, a change in the 2021. It used to just say retraining, and the uh, committee added uh, additional training and uh, going along with retraining. Uh, in safety-related work practices and applicable changes in 70 shall be performed at intervals not to exceed how many years? Right every three years. Boundaries, there's two types of boundaries associated with electrical safety in the workplace. There's arc flash boundary and there's shock protection boundaries. Uh, with an arc flash boundary, there is one boundary. With shock protection boundary, there are two boundaries. There's the uh, restricted approach boundary and limited approach boundary. Several additions back, there were three boundaries. And if you if, if your facility has uh, labels that are, are very old, you may actually have three boundaries showing on the, la the art flash label. The art flash boundary, this is uh, defined in Article 100. When an art flash hazard exists, an approach limit at a distance from, uh, from an arc source at which incident energy equals 1.2 calories per square centimeter. All right, the arc flash boundary can be uh, closer than the shock boundaries. The arc flash boundary can be further away than the shock boundaries. The, the farthest arc flash boundary I have ever seen was just a couple of months ago. At just over 235 feet, the arc flash boundary. Now, the, the label on there, um, the company didn't use, or they were told not to use for this particular project, not to use the two second uh, cutoff rule. So it had an incredibly high incident energy and it had an incredibly uh, far uh, arc flash boundary at over 235 feet away. The closest arc flash boundary I ever saw was uh, last week in Norwalk, Connecticut, I was up there for three days of training, and the closest arc flash boundary I've ever seen was two inches. Uh, before that, I think I had seen a, a three or four inch arc flash boundary, uh, but so they're all over the board as far as uh, close or far. Electrically safe work condition. This is a defined term in 70. It is a state in which 
Electrical conductors of circuit parts have been disconnected from energized parts, locked, tagged in accordance with established standards, tested to verify the absence of voltage, and if necessary, temporarily grounded for personal protection. Um, there are eight steps in most, in a lot of facilities, a lot of plants, um, they, they're, the only steps that will be needed would be one through seven. The reason being step number eight is applying temporary electrical safety grounds. Typ typically, the temporary electrical safety grounds are not installed uh, at 480 volts and below. And so there's a lot of plants, a lot of facilities where uh, most of the power comes into the plant is 480 volts and below. And a lot of places where the uh, electricians and maintenance people really just are supposed to just work on the 480 volts and below. And, and if they have medium to high voltage, a lot of times, not always, but a lot of times they'll bring in outside contractors. All right, so the, the eight steps in establishing and verifying an electrically safe work condition, uh, determine all electrical sources, open the disconnects, uh, visually verify if possible. That one, uh, number three, is if you have a, a safety switch or disconnect switch and you, you can open the switch up and visibly verify that all the blades have, have pulled out. It also would apply to rack in, rack in, rack in, rack out type or draw in, draw out type circuit breakers where you can either look through a window, or open the door and see that the, the breaker has f fully withdrawn. There's, the reason it says if possible, because it's not always possible. If you turn off a breaker, a regular circuit breaker, can you look at the contacts inside that circuit breaker to be able to tell that it, that they are separated, that they're that they're apart. Well, no, you can't. So uh, it's if it's possible, visually verify. Number four and number five were added uh, for in the last edition and release stored electrical energy, uh, block or relief stored non-electrical energy. Uh, even even though they were added to the 2018 edition. They've always been part of lockout tagout, so they were really included anyway because number six, apply lockout tagout devices, which would include going through the steps of lockout tagout. Uh, number seven, uh, voltage testing. I've already talked about number eight. Well, let's let's look at number seven, voltage testing. Number seven says use an adequately rated portable test instrument to test each phase conductor or circuit part to test for the absence of voltage. The 2018 edition said, uh, the last part of that, it said to verify it is de-energized. We, we often uh, talk about it as testing for the absence of voltage. So this was the wording that was just added to the uh, 2021 edition. It's, there's no big change there. It's just more of a, a wording change. Well, what do we do? We test each phase conductor or circuit part, both phase to phase and phase to ground. Before the test and after the test, we have to determine the test instrument is operating good or satisfactory through verification on any known voltage source. It used to say a known voltage source, and this, this was a small change in the last edition. It went from uh, on a known voltage source to any known voltage source. So this is it, the um, it, what it means. Any it you don't have if you're testing uh, 480 volt, uh, three phase 480 volt. You turned off a, a disconnect, uh, and you're going to change out a motor. And so you're you've opened the disconnect up. You visually verified. You're on the bottom side of that disconnect you're testing for the absence of voltage, both phase to phase and phase to ground. Before the test, you have to test the tester. After the test, you have to test the tester to make sure it is still working. And a lot of times this is known as live dead live test. In fact, it's a little bit easier to remember uh, live dead live because the, 
the last part, testing the tester after testing for the absence of voltage is so easy to forget. Uh, when I'm working with uh, teaching classes and, and a lot of times uh, companies will have me stay another day for hands-on training, a day or half a day for hands-on training, we will go through the scenario, we'll, we'll, everybody will suit up, we'll be uh, putting a piece of equipment into an electrically safe work condition. And so they're testing the tester, they're testing phase to phase and phase to ground to make sure of the absence of voltage. And a lot of times, a lot of people forget to test the tester again. You go, oh, okay, it's electrically safe and and you're done. And I have to say, well, wait a minute, is there anything else that needs to be done before this equipment can be said it is in an, in an electrically safe work condition? Yes, that means you have to test the tester again. On a 480 volt, you can use a 120 volt circuit. On a 120, you can use a 120 on a on any known voltage source. So it could be 120, it could be, in fact, it could be a battery. It could be a nine volt or a double A battery. I, I call, always caution that, I always say, yes, that can be done, but I caution about that because on a lot of digital multimeters, when you're testing DC, you change the dial to DC. Then you go to check AC, you got to remember to turn it back to AC and to do testing phase to phase and phase to ground. Then when you're checking your meter again, you turn it back to DC to be able to check the meter with a battery. Well, this fluke meter, and I'm, I'm not a rep for fluke, I just, I like the fluke products. Uh, this fluke happens uh, to have the same dial setting whether you're testing AC or DC, which that's great. Um, also, Fluke has, and this is great, I always I always take it with me when I'm going to teach and show it, and, and as well as the T6-1000 meter. But this, this meter is, Fluke's meter is called a, a proving unit, their PRV240 proving unit. With this meter, it's just, it's, it's, well, you can see how big it is compared to the hands. It's not very big. And what this meter is for is giving someone a quick and easy access to voltage. The, the contacts on this, if you're, if you're testing for AC, DC, it doesn't matter red or black, black or red. It doesn't matter. It does have a switch on the right side uh, that you can see in, in both those pictures that it you can change this from alternating current to DC. Well, if it's if you're testing 208, if you're testing 480, then you're probably going to have it into alternating current. This meter has four AA batteries and it gives about 240 volts uh, reading. So it, it's easy to just put the meter up right where you're working with the magnet, it just sticks there. And and so you you test your meter to make sure your meter's working, you test for the absence of voltage, and you, and you have this uh, device to make it easy to be able to test your meter again. All right, so testing for the absence of voltage. Uh, here was some hands-on training con consulting I did a couple of years ago, and I think this was, uh, I think this was charts, uh, I think it was uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, test each phase conductor or circuit part. How do we do that? We, we check it phase to phase and phase to ground. Well, what about afterwards again? Well, after the test, remember live, dead, live. After the test, we make sure that the, uh, that the device is still working properly through verification on any known voltage source. Uh, again, this device is right there. Um, the it, I, I got this guy kind of in it was coming up with his hands. He did end up uh, testing with both leads into the device. It almost looks like he's testing one in the meter and one in the device, but his his uh, right hand is actually coming up and, and into the uh, to be able to test the device again or his uh, meter again. Shock protection boundaries. I mentioned that there are two. There's a limited approach boundary. It is the farthest away. There's a restricted 
approach shock boundary, it is the closest. These boundaries have to, are, are applicable where personnel are approaching exposed energized electrical conductors and circuit parts. Shock protection boundaries are in tables 130.4 DA and B. Uh, the A is for alternating current, the B is for uh, direct current. There's a lot of requirements uh, with these shock boundaries other than just mentioning, hey, there's two of them. There's things we do or don't do as qualified persons. There's things that that unqualified persons uh, do or don't do as far as staying out of the boundaries. And so there's, there's in this section, 130.4 uh, in 70, this, this gives us all the requirements for the, uh, for the shock boundaries. All right, so here's an illustration. Circle, the red sphere, represents energized electrical conductors or circuit parts. The closest boundary out from that and up to 750 volts, that restricted approach boundary is 12 inches or one foot. The limited approach boundary is the farthest boundary from live energized electrical conductors or circuit parts. It is, and up to 750 volts, it's three and a half feet. Shock protection, employees shall wear rubber insulating gloves with leather protectors where there's a danger of hand injury from electric shock because of contact with energized electrical conductors and circuit parts. The rubber insulating gloves have to be rated for the voltage for which the glove is going to be exposed. Uh, there's, there's the different classes. There's a class uh, double zero or double lot for 500 volt. Uh, there's a class uh, zero, uh, which has a red label. The, the class double zero or double lot has a tan label. The red label is good for 1,000 volts. And we, have, uh, we now have a new table in the newest edition of 70E that shows us the different classes and also it shows us the, the distance of gap that you're supposed to have uh, between the end of the rubber cuff and the end of the leather cuff. Arc flash PPE. One of the following methods have to be used for selecting arc flash PPE. Uh, number one is the incident energy analysis method according to 130.5G. So having, uh, whether you do it in-house or have a company come in, uh, have the, the, the study done uh, on your facility and the labels applied on the electrical equipment. Uh, the number two, the arc flash PP category method in accordance with 130.7C15, which we'll look at this a little bit more in detail here in a few minutes. Either method, but not both, apply uh, shall uh, shall be permitted to be used on the same piece of equipment all right so what this means is all right so uh, an arc flash analysis was done there's a label on the equipment you don't like what the label says so you go to 70e and say oh this is uh, this one is closer well for one thing again we're going to mention i'm going to mention this in a few minutes about the parameters but it's it's basically this part is saying you can't pick and choose. It's either one or the other, uh, not, not, not both on the same piece of equipment. Equipment labeling, well, what has to be labeled? 130.5H is clear at what has to be labeled. Electrical equipment such as switchboards, panel boards, industrial control panels, meter socket enclosures, and motor control centers that are in other than dwellings, this doesn't apply to dwellings, and here's the key thing, or a key part of this, this requirement, and are likely to require examination, adjustment, servicing, or maintenance while energized, shall be field marked with a label containing all of the following information. All right, so what equipment has to be labeled? It would, you have to determine what is likely to require examination, adjustment, servicing, or, or maintenance while it's energized. Uh, 120 208 volt three phase panel board, 277 volt, uh, 277 480 volt three phase panel board. I would think these are likely to require examination, adjustment, servicing, or maintenance while they're ener energized. Um, what about a transformer? Well, um, 
you could, I could argue both ways on a transformer saying, well, I'm never going to be in this transformer with the Ener Energized. I could be on the disconnect uh, before it. I could, on the line side, I could be on the disconnect on the load side. So uh, that it is, I said it's clear, but it, there is uh, some determination that you have to do whether, uh, is what equipment, you know, how far down the line and what all needs to be labeled. The information that is required on the label, nominal system voltage, arc flash boundary, at least one of the following, available incident energy and corresponding working distance or arc flash PP category in table 130.7C15A or 130.7C15B for the equipment, but you're not supposed to have both of this, both of these, uh, it's information on a label. Now, in the past, we have seen that on a, I've seen that on a lot of labels, where it had the incident energy at the working distance, and it also had the arc flash PPE category. Um, also, you could have on a label minimum arc rating of clothing. You could have on a label site specific level of PPE, which it, it, it could be designated by, by the facility, by the site. Here's a label showing available incident energy. So incident energy and a working distance, this label does not have the category on it. This one is showing the arc flash boundary at four feet, five inches. It's showing an incident energy of 6.7 calories per square centimeter at a working distance of 18 inches. So this is showing incident energy. Nowhere on this label is it showing category of, of PPE. Nominal system voltage has to be on the label. This is on my label here. Uh, shock hazard when the cover is removed. It, this label is showing the shock boundaries, limited approach boundary, restricted approach boundary. But the shock boundaries don't have to be on a label. Although this is the they've never required shock boundaries have never required to be on a label. I don't I have never seen a label without the shock boundaries on the label. So although they're not required to be there, uh, again, I, I've never seen a label without the shock boundaries. It's even showing the uh, required voltage rated glove, a class uh, double lot, double zero voltage rated glove. Now, a lot of places, instead of the double zero, the, the 500 volt glove, they have for their employees, their qualified people, um, a class zero, a 1000 volt rated glove. And the reason is you, you get more protection, but there's really, I, I've got both. I've got a 500 volt rated glove and a 1000 volt rated glove, and I can't tell the difference between uh, the, the, the dexterity difference between the two. So you might as well have a little bit higher uh, shock and, and uh, protection. The label is, the, the date is on this label, uh, 3-26-2018. I do my own illustrations, and, and if uh, you may not be familiar with who I am and, and the books that I've written and the magazine articles I used to write for Electrical Contractor Magazine, but I put a lot of my own information or some of my own information, I kind of slide it into my, uh, my drawing. Uh, for example, the date on this label, not the year, the, the month, March 26, that's my wife's birthday. Now, I have never forgotten her birthday yet, but in case I ever do, I'm, I'm prepared. I'm, I'm, I know that it's, it's in a lot, uh, here and there throughout uh, my presentations and drawings and books. Now, the, the panel LJM, that's my wife's initials. Again, the 2018 is not the year of, of her birth. Uh, I, I, because, um, labels have to be uh, reviewed every five years, I'm going to have a label or date showing uh, within a five-year period of when I'm teaching this uh, seminar or webinar. 
here's a label showing the arc flash pp category this one now is not showing incident energy this one is showing uh, okay the arc flash pp category is at category two uh, as far as your, your uh, arc flash ppe now we do have a table uh, a table that was added in the uh, the previous edition for uh, for, for selecting PPE when you have an incident energy analysis, an arc flash analysis performed. And so we technically would not go to um, category two, but this is, this is showing on this label. Again, the 480 volts is on the label. Voltage has to be, uh, arc flash boundary has to be, PP category is one of the items we can put on, on it in, as, as, and instead of uh, incident, or it is the item in, instead of incident energy. Uh, the date on this one is 327. Uh, that's our anniversary. Again, I've not ever forgotten any of these dates yet. Arc flash PV category method. Instead of performing an incident energy analysis, it is permissible to use the arc flash PP tables in 70E if meeting the, the parameters. That's that's the key to using those tables. The estimated maximum available fault current, the maximum fault clearing times, and minimum working distances for various AC equipment types or, or classifications are listed in Table 130.7 C15A. And we'll look at these the, this method of doing this uh, in in a few minutes here. We'll get into uh, using the tables. 70 tables may not be permitted or they're not permitted if an incident energy analysis shall be required in accordance with 130.5G for the following. Task not listed in table 130.7C15. So we, we have a certain amount of task uh, that are in the table. If the task that's going to be performed is not listed in the table, then an arc flash analysis is required, uh, labeling is required. Uh, also power systems with greater than estimated maximum available fault current, we'll look at that in a few minutes, uh, power systems with longer than maximum fault clearing times, and also tasks with less than minimum working distances. We'll, we'll talk about all of those here in a few minutes. Uh, okay, what about using the tables? First, we use table 130.5C to see if arc flash PPE is required. Next, if it is required, we use table 130.7C15A for alternating current or AC systems or uh, C15B for DC systems to determine the arc flash uh, PPE category. Finally, we're going to use table 130.7C15C to select our arc rated clothing. Again, we're going to look at all of this stuff um, uh, starting in the next slide here. Table 130.5C, there's, uh, it was revised a little bit. The top part was the same. Um, and look what I have in, in the red bold uh, block uh, the, in, inside the, the lines. This was a new one that was added. And this is for, all right, looking on the right side or the, the, the top right side, it says equipment condition. With all that's showing on this slide, it doesn't matter what the equipment conditions are. It's just any conditions. Well, then we go further to the right. It says likelihood of occurrence. What that means is if it says no, you don't need arc rated PPE. If it says yes, you need arc rated PPE. So, for example, the top, uh, to, to reading a panel meter while operating a meter switch. Uh, with that, you're standing outside a closed panel. You're, you're operating maybe a digital uh, readout on, on a display to read current or voltage or KVA, what, whatever kind of information, but you're standing outside the panel with everything closed up. Uh, going on down to the likelihood of occurrence, yes, for voltage, uh, for AC systems work on energized electrical conductors and circuit parts, including voltage testing, Remember that one because we're going to come back to that one. Uh, it would mean, yes, likelihood of occurrence, uh, uh, an arc flash is likely. So that means we would have to have 
uh, arc rated PPE, arc flash PPE. All right, the, the next sentence was added in the 2021 edition. Operating a circuit breaker or switch the first time after installation or completion of maintenance in the equipment. What this means is if you're, you are turning on a circuit breaker or a disconnect switch the first time after it's installed or after there's uh, after completing maintenance on the equipment, it doesn't, again, it doesn't matter the conditions. And this is with the equipment all closed up. It would just standing in front of a circuit breaker or turning a disconnect switch on, safety switch on, after you've installed a disconnect switch, likelihood of occurrence is yes. What that means is because of this new sentence that was added, first time you turn a circuit breaker or a disconnect switch on, you have to be wearing arc rated PPE. You have to be suited up. Uh, 130.7C15, this is a, um, at the bottom of the table, uh, that same table, the equipment conditions, and they include normal and abnormal. Uh, this has been in there. There that last uh, that last block set of blocks under there. Uh, what's in the the left side? That's been uh, rewritten a little bit for the 2021 edition. I don't have a, a, a box around that, a uh, highlighted box, but that that one is a little bit changed in the uh, 2021 edition as well. All right, normal operating conditions. A normal operating condition exists when all of the following conditions are satisfied. The equipment has to be properly maintained. The equipment has to be properly uh, installed. The equipment is used in accordance with instructions that are included in the listing or labeling in accordance with manufacturer's instructions. Us guys have the biggest problem with reading and complying with instructions. The equipment doors are closed and secured. All equipment covers are in place and secured. Number four, the equipment doors are closed and secured. This does not mean the door covering the, the handles in a panel board, or the breaker handles in a panel board. Because if you close that door, then you can't turn on or off the breakers. Uh, that, that door exposing just the breaker handles and no live electrical conductors and circuit parts, that door is fine to leave open. A, a industrial panel and industrial control panel door, that door needs to be closed to for the equipment to be in a normal operating condition. Number six, there is no evidence of impending failure. So here's a problem. Let's work through this problem. A, the task is to perform voltage testing on a 200 amp, three phase, 480, 277 volt panel board. I'm giving you the available fault current. I'm giving you the clearing time. Why? Because if we didn't have this, then we would not be able to use the tables in 70E for selecting PPE. Now on the right is a panel board that I have drawn. If, again, if you're familiar with some of my work, you'll, you'll see my brand name or my brand logo on the equipment. Uh, in, you've heard of Square D, right? Well, the Miller brand, as in the, the illustration here, the Miller brand is the Square M brand. It is the Cadillac of equipment. It is the, the top. So that, that's, uh, you've seen this, the, um, it, I've got the uh, Square M Miller brand up there. All right, so we're going to the table to to work tables to work all this stuff out and 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 figure out exactly what to do. But just right off the top of your head, perform voltage testing on an energized panel board. It's opened up. There are live electrical conductors and circuit parts that will be accessible directly in front of you. Is PPE required? If so, provide all the details. Well, certainly, now we're going to see this with the tables, but this is one of those common sense things that you've got live energized electrical equipment opened up in front of you and you're going to do voltage testing. 
All right, so we first look at table 130.5C to see if r clash PPE is required. And under this one, equipment condition, any, it, it, again, it doesn't matter. Uh, and this was the line I said a while ago, remember this. For AC systems, work on energized electrical conductors or circuit parts, including voltage testing. Well, we're doing voltage testing. So likelihood of occurrence, yes. What that means is yes, uh, arc flash, arc rated PPE is required. You knew this without even looking it up, but we just, we confirmed it. Uh, it, it is, uh, arc flash PPE is likely, arc flash PPE is required. Next, check to see if the equipment is listed in table 130.7C15A. If the equipment is listed, we're gonna check the parameters. All right, on the, the second row, uh, panel boards or other equipment greater than 240 volts, because we were looking at a 480 volt panel board, greater than 240 volts up to 600. The parameters are maximum 25 kA available fault current, uh, maximum clearing time of 0 0.03 second. All right, available fault current, check. Uh, clearing time, check. I, I gave you the working distance of 18 inches. Uh, or that's what we're, we're, we're going to use that one. We're right in there with it. Uh, yes, therefore, we are able to use this table. Now we're going to find the arc flash and PPE category. Again, the second row down, uh, arc flash PPE category is two. And looking further to the right, you'll see the arc flash boundary is three feet. Then we go to table 130.7C15C and we find the required clothing for PPE category two. There was a little bit of change to the tables one through four in this uh, newest 2021 edition of 70E. Uh, look on the right side of uh, the arc rated clothing, uh, the um, high visibility apparel was added and there was a footnote F that was added as well. On the right side, um, arc rated gloves or rubber insulating gloves with leather protectors was added to the tables. Now there was no, there's no change with that because that was always, uh, it wasn't on the table before, but it was some, we had some footnotes that uh, we went by where uh, instead of heavy duty leather gloves or arc rated gloves, uh, we could wear uh, rubber gloves with leather protectors. So the high-vis uh, apparel, high-visibility apparel. Uh, and and let me, let's go back here. The, um, the footnote F, uh, the wording was added, but then the footnote F was added. It was added to all four category tables, one through four. And with this, this was a little bit of change on, in this one, like the table, was added high visibility apparel. Uh, so garments worn as outer layers over arc rated clothing, such as jackets, high visibility apparel or rainwear shall also be made from arc rated material. Absolutely, if you've got um, a rainwear, if you've got outerwear, a jacket, anything on the outer layer has to have an arc rating. Well, this was a, to me, this was a big change. Um, it's what this one, and it continued on within that same section, 130.7C9B. What this says is the arc rating of outerwear over arc rated clothing as protection from elements or for other safety purposes, such as high visibility apparel, and that are not used as part of a layered system, shall not be required to be equal to or greater than estimated incident energy exposure. I was always under the assumption or I always thought that anything on the outside, the arc rating of the clothing had to be equal to or greater than the incident energy uh, exposure. Well, it, it does not. Uh, it only has to have an arc rating. Uh, for example, maybe we've got a, uh, we're going to be working uh, outside and we have to wear uh, high visibility clothing. Now they also have um, high visibility um, uh, uh, clothing or like a shirt and, and clothing apparel that are 
that are that have the full arc rating uh, have a, a high visibility shirt from bulwark that is um, close to nine 8.7 8.8 i think and it is bright it has the reflectors on it uh, so it is just with, with wearing that shirt you wouldn't have to wear uh, a vest like this but i just i pulled this one off just and put it up here just to show uh, an example we've got uh, maybe an incident energy on a label of equipment that's maybe seven calories of incident energy. And so what we're wearing is 8.8, 8.9 arc rated clothing, uh, pants and shirts or, or coveralls, then we're good with that. And if we have to have something on the outside, it only has to have an arc rating. Here's a vest, this vest has an ATPV, arc thermal performance value rating of 4.9 uh, calories per square centimeter. Now it doesn't have seven, but we're still able to use this, um, even though that it does it, it, it does not have to equal or exceed the incident energy exposure. Summary: NPA contains provisions to keep employees safe in the workplace. Uh, best electrical strategy is to turn it off and lock it out. Um, and I will get uh, a, I will put together a, a, a PDF of this presentation so that uh, you can get it from Grace. Uh, my contact information is on the uh, this slide. You'll see that also if you get the uh, the information as far as the PDF from Grace, um, my name phone number my email address and i am on linkedin and and sometimes i put funny things on linkedin sometimes i put serious things on linkedin i'm i'm pretty easy to find i'm uh, of course if and if someone emails me that's great uh, put your phone number please uh, include your phone number uh, a lot of times it's easier for me to uh, call than it is to uh, write back and forth and ask a lot of questions in order to get enough information. Um, so, but times like today, of course, my phone is turned off and when I'm teaching, uh, I'll be teaching next Wednesday and Thursday in Laurel, Mississippi and to a water company down there. So I'm sometimes working out of my house and sometimes out and about teaching. Of course, for six months, I never, I didn't go anywhere, but uh, some companies are starting to uh, call again and, and want the training and just keep us social distanced in the training. Uh, I do uh, do a lot of, of course, I was doing a lot of seminars. In fact, this year I started out on a bang by going to uh, the country of Suriname and then uh, had uh, two training classes in Florida uh, in January as well. Uh, off, I was off in February updating some, uh, a couple of, electrical books uh, one of the things a lot of a lot of electricians are very familiar with the book um, ugly's book electrical references and i was honored back in the fall of this year to be the one to update uh, asked to be the one asked to update the ugly's book ugly's electrical references and ugly's uh, has some additional books i'm working on right now um, updating uh, Ugly's electrical safety and NPA 70E. So sometimes I'm at the house working and, and can take a call. Sometimes uh, I can't. I'll be out and available uh, out and, and teaching. So uh, I shouldn't have much of a difficulty getting a hold of me.